into this, but I want you to be able to see Connor. So is that okay, Holly? <laughs> All right. So I am really honored to introduce our speaker today, Judith Connor. Um, Connor is a writer, psychologist, and educator. She earned her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, with dissertation research conducted in Panama, where she had her son, Al G. <laughs> Connor, Connor wrote the comedy bits of this. <laughs> She has explored the ocean from research ships and sailboats and underwater using scuba, submersibles, and living in a habitat. She's participated in oceanic expeditions to all of the continents. At Mbari, Connor directs the Institute's external affairs. Working with Mbari's talented staff, she oversees institutional websites, publications, events, library services, and video laboratory support. A resident of the Elkhorn Slough watershed, Connor serves as vice president of the board of directors of the Elkhorn Slough Foundation and as chair of its land committee. She has a special interest in native plants and seaweeds and in control of invasive species. And in all of that impressive description of our accomplishments, you may have noticed the library services piece. As hopefully all of you know, the library serves both Moss Landing and Ambari, and this partnership is key in making our library what it is, and Connor is an integral part of that partnership. So thank you, Connor. Uh, so without further ado, Connor will be speaking to us today about developing diversity in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Please give her a warm welcome. was suggested to me by Michael Lee and Katie. I wasn't sure I had the expertise to really give the presentation, but then I decided I would just dig into it and find out as much as I can to share with you. Uh, because it is a really important concept to me uh, in terms of how do we develop a, a more diverse work um, force who can really participate and contribute to science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, I want to start off by really uh, pointing out um, one of my young friends, not, not you, Lindsay, but <laughs> someone even younger. Um, she's six years old, and she is very confident that she's a smart person already. And uh, recently she said to her mother, um, are all girls smart? And her mother said, some girls are smart, some boys are smart. And she said, well, I'm smart like you, mom. I'm, I'm really smart. We're smarter than daddy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, what I have found in going through this study over the past few weeks to pull together information about why are there, is there such a lack of diversity in our workforce? Um, I come back to the idea of young women and being really confident in their abilities and hanging on to that because a lot of young women lose it as they go through the, the normal um, you know, school um, years. And so starting off just looking at um, some of these um, tests that are done internationally on math and science studies. I thought I would uh, talk a little bit about Peggy Carr's um, report on testing that has been done internationally over the years. So this is the trends in international mathematics and science study. It's offered about every four years, and you can see the participation at fourth grade level involves 55 education systems around the world, and in the eighth grade um, test, it's 44 education systems. So North America is well represented, Europe uh, and Australia, and less so uh, parts of Asia and South America. But nonetheless, you know, you can really look here and see um, how does the U.S. Um, how do students in fourth grade and eighth grade in the U.S. compare with other countries? So, for example, oh, and there's also this uh, advanced mathematics that was started more recently, so the, the data don't go back as far for the advanced. Uh, this is for the last year of secondary school and how students do in um, advanced math and physics compared with other countries. So um, 
basically looking first at uh, the U.S. mathematics performance in, the, in this international con uh, context for fourth graders. Uh, you can see the time scale at the bottom, the, uh, the, the scale for determining the spread from 1,000, the mean was 500. And you can see the U.S. is at 539. I, I wasn't quite sure how she interpreted the data and pulling this together. But she did identify uh, the 10 education systems that were higher than the U.S. average. And I don't understand why England is separated out, even though very closely uh, numerical numbers uh, are around that. Um, and there were nine education systems that were not measurably different from the overall U.S., including one from Florida. Uh, interesting to point out, Singapore is has the top rating, and Singapore is a, an incredibly diverse city country. It's just pretty amazing to see something that's very diverse in terms of religions and nationalities, and nonetheless, their school system is really excellent. And then there are 34 education systems that rank much lower than the United States, so you may want to not take your children to Morocco or Saudi Arabia for their education. Looking at mathematics performance in eighth grade uh, in 2015, you can see here the, the mean for the United States was 518, and there were eight education systems that were higher than the U.S. average. Once again, Singapore is right up on top. And then uh, 10 education systems that weren't measurably different from the U.S. average, and then 24 that were below the average for the United States. And now looking in addition to the fourth and eighth grade in terms of science achievement on these tests, you can see uh, once again the, the um, center point is uh, a score of 500, and the U.S. was at 546. You can see seven education systems. Singapore's on top. Seven are higher than the U.S. average. Seven are not measurably different from the U.S. And then these are the 38 education systems that are much lower than the U.S. average. In terms of the science per performance in the eighth grade in 2015, the U.S. comes in at 530. There were seven education systems that were scored higher than the U.S., nine education systems that weren't measurably different from the U.S., and then 26 that are lower than the U.S. average. And now if we look at it by gender, look at this. Okay, these are years of assessment from 1995 when they started this international assessment through 2015, and you can see how sporadically the tests are given. And you can see the difference uh, between males and females in grade four. In grade eight, the, the um, spread between males and females uh, in terms of the mathematic ability. And then the advanced, you can see how very far apart the genders are in terms of uh, advanced math and phys uh, physics where the blue lines represent the males and the red lines represent the females. Now looking at science scores by gender, you can see uh, grade four, they're relatively close to each other. Uh, males and females are uh, gathering, they're getting closer to a similar score by grade eight. And then in the advanced, still really disparate scores between the two genders. So, you can see by the, these international tests, uh, for the U.S., gender scores favor males in uh, both math and science in grades 4 and 12, and uh, science at grade 8, but there's no gender difference in mathematics in grade 8. So real knowledge, as Confucius says, real knowledge is to know the extent of one's ignorance. and. Um, once again, I recognize my ignorance. 
Um, so a study done by Erlinger and Dunning in Cornell in tw 2003 that they continue to build on and they're doing additional studies. But this was one where they were trying to figure out the confidence levels of genders that are taking a psychology class. And they had uh, the opportunity to get extra credit or in some cases to earn money depending upon how they score. So the two questions they were addressing was, am, am I good in science? And did I get the question right? So these, the, the two researchers, they had 10 questions that they pulled off the GRE tests and they gave them to uh, females and uh, they asked before the test for the male and female participants to grade themselves on a scale of one to 10, whether they thought they were competent to do well on this test. And you can see the, the women came in at a, a grade of 6.5. They test, they graded themselves. And then the men at 7.6. After the test, the women lowered their estimate of what they thought they did on the, the, the test. And men lowered it also, but not as much. And in fact, the scores of the males and females weren't statistically different. It's sort of like confidence plays a big part in finding out uh, how you'll continue to learn and achieve in STEM careers. At the same time, um, there's also the element of being overconfident. And there were other tests that I was reading about where um, the males just always assumed that they were right um, even though their scores came down really low, they were just confident that something was wrong with the test and not with them. So looking at my, my, this whole uh, exercise in learning more about gender, um, I thought I would put it in the context of my own career because my career is wrapping up, my career in terms of um, working at Ambari is wrapping up and the beginning of next year I'll be free. Um, <laughs> This is a picture of uh, my family, just sort of give you a sense of my background, because I bet not a lot of you in the room had nine siblings. But I was number seven of 10, and I, had, I have six sisters. And so you grew up in a really chaotic, noisy house where um, I, was, I was definitely confident, even at the age of two, that um, I was among the smarter of the sisters. And um, all of us were encouraged to you know, go on to, to college to get an education. My parents thought that was really important because they didn't have the opportunity. And so they said, if you can save up the money and pay for your tuition and your books, you can live at home for free. And you, you can get room and board from us as long as you're going to school. And um, here's a picture of the University of Maryland where I did my undergraduate work. Uh, I didn't go to the University of Maryland in 1986. 1950, 1856, uh, but it's interesting to look at, okay, this was one of the uh, beginning land-grant colleges, and it was started in 1856, and the first women were admitted in 1916. Um, shortly before I went to the University of Maryland, they changed the rules so that you didn't have to wear a skirt to classes. I mean, unbelievable, but um, at any rate, um, University of Maryland was a really good opportunity to for me because I didn't have a lot of science or e any STEM classes going through high school. Uh, I think the opportunities are much broader now, but um, I thought I would be a French major when I got to the University of Maryland because my grandmother was French and I loved, I, I loved reading and speaking in French. And um, you, even to be a French major, you had to take at least one science class. So I took botany and I discovered I loved botany. And I thought about being a botany major, but they said you had to take a lot of chemistry and physics, and I had never taken chemistry or physics. So I thought one step at a time. So I took chemistry, and I loved chemistry. I was shocked. And then I loved biochemistry, and physics was fun, and quantitative analysis was fun. I just was so shocked and pleased to discover, especially having moved away from home, if you had a little quiet, you could actually study and do better in your classes, and um, it was just really amazing to get out with a double major in botany and uh, biochemistry 
and decide I'm going out to make my way in the world and make a difference. And boy, I learned a lot. My first job after college was working with Walter Aidey. He uh, still is a scientist at the National Museum of Natural History, the Smithsonian uh, in Washington, D.C. And Walter studies coral and algae, and he really wanted to look at the health and impact of coral and algae on coral reefs in the Caribbean. The only problem was he didn't have a boat. And so Walter was the most amazing person to work with in that he decided if you make up your mind and you, you can do it. And so we built a boat in his backyard. So we would work at the museum in his lab all, all day, go in early in the morning, work until um, about five at night, and then we'd go out to his house. We'd all have dinner together, and then we'd work on the boat, putting, building the boat until um, 11 o'clock at night, and then go home and go to bed and get up the next day and do it. And after a year, it was pretty amazing because we took the boat and we put it in the Potomac River, and we started heading off. And here you can see the motor sailor, the Coralina, and what was really amazing about working with Walter, he just took it for granted that whoever was on the team, male, female, old, young, it, it, that they were going to give their all, and they were going to be both physically contributing to what we were doing as well as intellectually contributing. And he changed my life because the first night we were cruising down the Potomac toward Chesapeake Bay, you know, he had all of us around the table, and there were, I think there were eight of us on the boat at that time, and he just said, um, okay, you'll do the fish, and you'll do the corals, and Connor, you'll do the seaweeds. And I was like, I don't want to do the seaweeds. I want to do the corals or something cool. And he said, no, 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 you have a botany degree. You're going to do the seaweeds. But um, it was just an amazing experience because we'd all spend all day in the water, and then we'd come back, and at dinner every night, we'd talk about what did you see, and uh, you know, I was really head down in the seaweeds learning all these little tiny things that live in the Caribbean. And people would say, I, you know, I couldn't believe that hammerhead shark didn't even bother you and you just kept on working and I, I, never, I never saw it, you know. <laughs> and so it was actually a three-year expedition living on that little boat. We uh, left Washington, D.C. see if I can... So here's Washington. We came down the intercoastal waterway inside the East Coast, and then left from Miami, jumped out to the Bahamas, worked our way down to uh, uh, St. Croix, where we stayed for a, a year and worked up our samples, and then did a lot of uh, aerial reconnaissance using a, a small plane that we took the doors off of, and you'd have one of the, the people, um, actually he's here in the audience, uh, who was the photographer. And so he would uh, tie himself into the airplane and then they'd sail, they'd uh, fly out over coral reefs and turn the airplane sideways and he'd just hang out and take pictures. And then we'd map the slides onto mylar so that we could actually take good visuals of the reefs in the water with us and we could identify all the, the corals and um, you know, different species that we saw on the maps we were making every day. It was the most amazing kind of job for somebody just out of college. I wore a bathing suit to work every day. You know, it was just incredible. And Walter also assumed that we would, if we didn't have mechanical skills, we would develop them. And so each of us had an engine. At one point, I had um, the compressor for filling up the tank, the scuba tanks. Uh, and at one point, I had the um, outboard motor. But other people, they had the big motor on the, the boat. And you know, we just took turns helping each other out. And the fact that we started off with new equipment, you should be able to keep things alive for, for three years. And it was just a really amazing work experience for me to be part of the team but also recognized for contributions that I could make. And so that led me at the end of the three years to really consider what do I want to do with my life and decided to go across the country from the East Coast and get my PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley was started in 1868, um, and I didn't go to Berkeley in 1868 either. Um, 
And it was founded in 1868, and women were first admitted as equal applicants to the males in 1871. That's pretty short time for, um, for women to be accepted, but it's almost part of our history of, of statehood. The Botany Department, where I was studying, was founded in 1885. And the year that I finished up at Cal and they asked me to stay on as a lecturer to um, replace somebody that was on sabbatical leave was 1885. And the graduating class in the botany department asked me to give the, the talk at their graduation. I thought, that's cool. You know, there are so many women in the botany department graduating class. I'm gonna make it about women over the years, historically, 100 years of botany at, at Berkeley. And, and so I did research and it looked like from the beginning of women being admitted in the botany department, the undergraduates were predominantly female. When you get to the master's degrees, it was about 50-50. And when you get to the PhDs, it dropped way off. It was really male dominated. And the faculty, that same sort, it, it got even worse. I mean, 100 years of botany department, there was never a tenured female. And the bot botany department was closed, it ended in, 18, in 1985, that, that same year. And so that was the end of botany as we knew it. Now they have plant, plant science and they have uh, plant ecology other groups, but you know, 100 years without a tenured female on the faculty. I, and I always thought Berkeley was you know, so liberal and amazing, and it was a great experience for me, um, and really helped me develop my career uh, going forward. I, I was fortunate to be invited on a lot of expeditions because of having lived on the boat and worked well at, you know, out at sea for uh, those three years. And um, I did a postdoc afterwards at Stanford University. This is Hopkins Marine Station, which uh, is, of course, right next to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And then after my postdoc at Hopkins, I, I sort of climbed the fence, went over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And for me, that was a really completely different kind of experience because I had gotten so wrapped up in research and um, you know, being at sea, um, I, and I had sort of dropped a lot of the creative sides of um, my experience. And so working at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and at, at Stanford, I taught in both institutions, and the aquarium gave me opportunities to write books and develop exhibits and work with artists. And I, I mean, hopefully you all have been to the aquarium and you know how beautiful it is there. Well, that, it's the product of all these incredibly creative minds, and you form teams to develop, you know, whether you're working on a book about the kelp forests or about the deep sea and the research that's going on at Ambari or exhibits to convey that to the public. It's just an amazing place. And I can remember, you know, my parents who, um, they're, they're dead now, but when I took them to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and I stood them in front of the kelp forest the first time, they went, all of a sudden they got it. They understood why I was hanging out in the ocean all the time. And you know, it was just such a beautiful experience. And of course, having a boss, a younger woman as a boss, she, she's amazing. You know, she just is a real um, guide in how to, how to uh, convey uh, conservation messages to the world, how to make a difference. And, um, I can remember one time she had an all hands meeting, all the staff at the aquarium, and she, she said, you know, Cannery Row is really looking trashy. There's just so much, people are dropping litter. So when you guys go out for a walk on the, you know, at lunchtime, if you see trash, just pick it up. And, you know, I thought, yeah, that's a good idea. And then the next day I went out for a walk and I saw her picking up trash. And I thought, she walks the walk. So after um, working at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, I had the opportunity to work with the first executive director of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and that was Dick Barber. I still worked at the aquarium, but I was working with Dick 
on writing and editing projects. And then uh, a few years later, um, Peter Brewer took over as the uh, executive director. Um, and so I have worked with five different executive directors now, presidents of Ambari, and it's, it's been an amazing experience. Um, in preparing for this talk, you know, I love going into work. I love the group that I'm working with. Um, but we're the only group at Ambari that has more females than males in it. And I'm just, I, I hardly even think about how inconsistent our goals for diversity are compared to the reality. Part of it is because so, there's so little turnover in the, in the jobs there. But if you look at the senior management, I'm one of seven on the management team, and I'm the only female. So the, uh, that gives us an 86% male dominated uh, management team. In terms of the staff, we have about 224 staff members. Um, so 72% are male. In terms of postdocs, it's getting a little better. So we have, um, how many postdocs did I say we had? We have had 102 postdocs since Empari was formed and about two thirds of them were male. And now looking at interns, well, if you look at staff in general, okay, that's higher than the postdocs. Interns, 39% male. And so I started looking through the database to see what's the story there. And the, the thing is, is we get about 220 uh, applications for intern positions. We have about 12 intern positions. They're internally funded by the Ambari annual funding from the Packard Foundation. And um, most of the interns, we get a, an abundance of applications from females. And so you just have a greater uh, range of people to consider when you have that many applications. And it's a really wonderful opportunity and really fun to then keep track of people over the years and see where they go. And so my first thought was the reason we have more female interns is because we have more female applications. And the reason there's a drop, is that because fewer females apply to postdoc positions or as staff or go into management? And it's, it's sort of like a combination of fewer apply and why would that be? And you know, one of the people that was my boss at the Research Institute uh, for quite a while, Marsha McNutt, she, she it, if there's one thing that she has, it's confidence. She is really smart. She's one of the smartest people I've ever met. She's somebody, she's the only person I have ever met that has a photographic memory. So if you're reading a book and she's reading a book, she's gonna remember every chapter and you're gonna come home every night and go through it again going, how does she keep track of everything? But she's just, pretty amazing, which accounts for the fact that, okay, she's a geophysicist, she got her PhD from um, Scripps, became a full professor at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She became executive director of Ambari and she worked with us for about 10 years and left when Obama called her to be director of the US Geological Survey and she moved to DC. Uh, and she still, even moving to DC, she continued to say, her job at Ambari was the best job in the world. Uh, after USGS, she became editor-in-chief of science, and then this past year, she was confirmed as president of the National Academy of Science, so she is gonna be the person that helps advise the president and the legislature uh, if the president should ever need <laughs> advice on science and technology. <laughs> So running the gauntlet, you know, so many different papers I was looking at in the past month. And this is just one representing women as full professors, the gender balance in astronomy. You can take any of the sciences and it's pretty similar in terms of um, the percent, graduate students, assistant, postdoc, adjunct, you know, et cetera, that the numbers are pretty discouraging. 
And, you know, so why? I know just from having worked with Dave Packard in the early days of Ambari, um, he was very much in favor of adding diversity to the workforce. And so they, they could not figure out why they had so few applicants for promotions within HP, and they went to the personnel records, and then they interviewed people that work at HP, and um, the women, for the most part, they applied for a promotion only if they thought they uh, met 100% of the qualifications that were listed for the job. Whereas men, they thought if they had 50 or 60%, close enough, what, what do you have to lose? It's that level of confidence that can really make a difference in helping get more diversity into the workforce. So I had mentioned, you know, University of Maryland, 1856 it was formed. First women were admitted in 1916. The first African Americans were admitted in 1951. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And if you look back on statistics of what opportunities uh, various races have had over the years, it's, it's pretty stunning. I mean, looking back from 1850 going forward into the 1990s, you can see the, the uh, percentage of uh, students from five to 19 years old that were enrolled in school period by race. And so white versus black and other races. And you can see they're coming together as you get into the, the uh, 1990s, but you're really talking about a cultural change in that if your grandparents and your parents didn't go to college, what is it that gives a family the stimulus to want to encourage their, their children to, to try something new like school or like going to the university or like considering a career in a STEM science. This is going, it's uh, not going back to 1850, but just 1940 going forward. And you can see the percentage of people 25 uh, years old or over that completed four years of college. And so, you know, the white males are still up ahead. And then under that white females, uh, the males of black and other races, and then the females of black and other races. But look how much further the white males are ahead and have been since 1840, 1940. And then looking at the degrees that have been earned by underrepresented minorities from 1995 to 2014, you can just see, okay, um, you know, the purple represents bachelor's degrees that are, the, the dotted lines are not science and engineering. The, the uh, full line, purple is bachelor's in science and engineering. Blue is master's degrees, dotted line being uh, non-science and engineering. And then the reds are non-science and engineering doctorates and the, the lowest one is the science and engineering doctorates. And so these are for women minorities and persons with disabilities uh, in science and engineering, and it was published in 2017. Sort of gets kind of depressing. Once again, looking at science and engineering, engineers working in different occupations that relate to science and engineering, and you know, males represent almost three quarters of the available positions white women, 18%, and then, you know, the rest is just a little slice for a lot of different diverse people. So given a, 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 a fork in the road, which one do you take? And um, this article by uh, Kenneth Gibbs and his team came out in PLOS One in 2014, and he was really uh, interested in career choices of underrepresented groups in uh, science. He, he was particularly interested in uh, recent biomedical PhDs. And so he interviewed 1,500 recent PhDs. And of those, 276 were uh, underrepresented minorities. And he found that uh, the women and underrepresented minorities were less likely, they were 36 to 54% less likely than white or Asian male 
to pr pursue research-oriented faculty positions. It's sort of like, I'm not saying that everybody should go for a faculty position because there's so many ways we can contribute with the skills we have in hand. And, you know, I definitely considered both paths and ended up doing something that was not strictly research-oriented. So from my first job working in research right at, after my undergraduate degree through working uh, at Hopkins Marine Station as a postdoc, you know, the arts and writing really became a bigger part of my life as I moved into the aquarium and uh, at Ambari. But I've been at Ambari now 25 years, and 22 of those years I've been in, in administration. And the, even though I really missed the fun parts of research and doing more writing when I switched over to being on the management team, it, the reward is hiring really good people and seeing that they'll do even better than I could have done if I never slept. I mean, the, my staff is really incredible. So I took that path, but there's still many paths to consider. So those of you who are launching a STEM career, who are really thinking about what is, how does this apply to you? You know, first of all, you want to go for content. I always tell people, you know, the 12-year-olds the that come and want to interview me about careers and say, I want to swim with the dolphins. Um, you know, I, I tell them, you know, you really need to branch out and take many different topics, many different subjects, and um, leave, leave creativity in there. You know, I think in engineering, creativity is more important than how many math classes you take. Um, so definitely look at the content, but look for more. So it was interesting, like Brown University had an undergraduate panel in 2014, and they asked uh, their, the undergraduates who were um, uh, underrepresented minorities in STEM education, and they, the panel, these students came up with things that they thought could improve their um, success uh, to make social justice a component of STEM education, where you're really thinking about that. Uh, communication skills, especially to be able to explain why you're in science to families that don't have that background or uh, to other non-scientists. Um, to connect STEM with other humanities, such as uh, with other uh, disciplines, such as the humanities and the arts, and, and that was certainly something that came to me from working at the aquarium. To provide more information about careers to those that are getting advanced STEM degrees. Um, guidance for achieving work-life balance. Would love to hear from some of you fa faculty members how successful you are at that. It's a juggle having small children and especially for a <coughs> two-career family. Taking into account diversity and cultural differences in evaluations. Um, one of the comments was that um, as teachers, we really need to be very specific in what our expectations are, and probably as mentors and as bosses also. Just make it clear how one can succeed. And um, learn to connect with mentors who are really invested in your success. And finally, provide ancillary training to really broaden um, the basic skills and interests. So I thought those were pretty powerful recommendations from undergraduates who are trying to imagine taking that next step. The American Association of University Women, they also have uh, published this book, Why So Few? And uh, you can see the URL below if you want to go and read the whole thing. But just to summarize, they suggested as you're working with uh, younger people, particularly high school uh, students that you want to encourage to consider uh, STEM careers, be aware of gender and racial biases, because we all have them. But at least if you're aware of them, it can help you move past it. Uh, communicate achievements so that kids, even in high school, they can start recognizing that diverse contributions from many different kinds of people can make for um, important achievements in STEM careers. 
diversify images and role models, you'll find, you know, if you look at um, publications that come out of Ambari, you'll see people of color and you'll see women doing science. It's be we're really trying to convey a better image even than what exists. You know, thank God we got Katie, a female librarian. But, you know, it's that whole trying to give role models and let young people identify with somebody in the images. Show young people, high school students, for example, that <coughs> skills grow over time. It's sort of like some young women will try something and if they don't get it, they'll give up and just decide I wasn't meant to understand that or I can't, I can't fix a motor because I didn't get it the first time. You know, spatial skills, they can be taught and you know, boys often have at more advanced spatial skills because of the way they play as young people, but there's no reason we can't enhance spatial skills in young women also. And encourage STEM classes in high school. <laughs> and recognize other career relevant skills. And so those are for all of us that are thinking of the next generation uh, STEM uh, students in college and graduate school. Um, and also just looking at it, in positions of where you're a professor or a lecturer or faculty that you should attract and support STEM majors as undergraduates, clarify the criteria for success, um, really assess the climate in your department. Is it really accepting and or can you really recognize bias? And diversify search committees. You know, I always think when I uh, interview for a position, um, I want to see somebody around the table that I can identify with in some ways. And you know, at my age I can identify with a lot of people because I work with a lot of different people. But you know, when you're just breaking into a career, it's hard to go and have like 17 men around the table and you're the only female in the room. Or God forbid you're the only Native American in the room or uh, African American. You know, there, it's really hard to recognize that you're different from everybody that's judging you when it's something so important to your career. So those of you who are launching a STEM career, definitely think about content. Uh, there's really very little room for mediocre in marine science, you know? You wanna be excellent. And you, you should be, those of you who are students here, you have a, you're here. This is really a, a great place to get uh, a graduate education. Don't forget creativity. You know, that will certainly help you whether you're designing your research or developing new technology. Uh, confidence. Have confidence in yourself. Don't be afraid. Get out there and try new things. Communication, that's become so important in terms of getting, um, showing the sh social value and relevance of the kind of work you're doing, whatever it is, whether it's teaching or your uh, ocean research or um, videos that you're making, you know, communication is so important. And connections, you know, use your connections, both your champions who should be, you know, your mentors, your, your uh, professors here that you've given over a couple years of your life to, you know, you sh should expect a lot of them. And it's, and also your critics, you know, you can have, uh, they don't have to be professionals. It can be your friends or your enemies. You can practice uh, giving talks. You can practice doing interviews. You can have people help you develop your CV. Um, those are the kinds of things that you can really develop for yourself. And if you should want to run ideas by me, you know, you have three quarters of a year to find me. I'm just down <laughs> at the end of the island. Any questions? You know, at Berkeley, we were expected to ask questions at every seminar. You not only had to go to the seminars, but you had to, Every graduate student was supposed to have questions, and so you just, 
just, oh, I hope nobody gets that question before I do. <laughs> so you don't have to all ask me a question, but you can. Um, as an undergraduate, the botany department at the University of Maryland was predominantly female students. So it, it, it was probably something like uh, 65, 35. Uh, when I got to Cal, that was a year, um, it, most of the graduate students that came into the PhD program were female, but it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, wasn't a huge difference between males and females, probably something like 45, 50. But, you know, it's all from growing up with all those girls in the house. <laughs> so anybody else in my family that went further in school if you did? Uh, I was the only one in my family that had a PhD. We um, have a couple master's degrees. Um, I think just about everybody except I have one brother who is disabled. He's a little, uh, has been slow since birth. And so, he was just ecstatic to get out of high school, but everybody else did at least take classes if not in the degrees. Yeah, and my mother, she went to fifth grade, my father finished high school. It was a depression. Yeah. Chaos. <laughs>